coming to you live, but not really. It is all pun and no circumstance with Ryder Richards on LetUsThinkAboutIt.com, the amateur hour you should never tune into. Welcome back. This is Ryder Richards, and I need to apologize for the long delay in getting this episode out. I've had several business trips and events happening and blah, 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 but also I needed to completely reread a book in order to approach this topic a little bit better. And of course, after all that effort, this is only the introduction to accelerationism. I will also have a second episode delving deeper into the pathos of humans dissolving themselves into the machine, shedding the flesh for speed and the velocity of libido, and so on and on and on, right? But today what we're going to do is start from the start. So, yes, in the beginning, there was a man, and he was lonely, so he made a machine. Well, of course, he tried to make a woman first from his rib, but we all know that she was too powerful to control. So he really just kind of hung out in the garage, pouting a lot, and tinkering on inanimate objects. Yeah, so that led us to the first machine, and whenever a problem needed solving, he would just make a bigger, better, faster machine. Until eventually, we have... Do ex machina. <laughs> okay, yeah, so this term comes from the gods in Greek theater, who would literally be craned into place or lifted through a trap door. They were machined onto the stage. And ever since, when we are introduced to an insurmountable problem or a quagmire from which there is no happy ending, the machines go to work and they save us by introducing a god. Now, you might say that this is also something men probably dreamed up while pouting in the garage, and I wouldn't argue that. But if we reference something like Neil Gaiman's American Gods, we kind of get a different reference for it. We can see that behind the scenes, while staging and paying lip service to the old gods, the new gods, those of techno-rationalism and money of capital, they're busy pulling the strings. They are winding the digital cranks. So, yes, of course, we believe in Jesus, but techno-progress will save us. Technology holds up our gods and allows for our beliefs. And thus we end up serving technology in disguise. Willem Flusser, he proves that tech uses us under the deception of us using it. So really here, we are the servant fooled into thinking we are the master. And of course, Andrew Feenberg says we have forgotten to insist that technology be aligned with human values. So we end up with machine values. We make the stuff and we just forget to put our own best interests in there somehow. So anyway, all this is to say, if you're not programming yourself, you are being programmed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, these kind of lines, right? Uh, the pervasive ubiquity of tech actually prompts us to speak of ourselves in the linguistic subroutines of technology. Programming the self to avoid being programmed. Yes, yes. I mean, this becomes a laughable defense because it entreats us to assume we are machine-like. We're talking in the language of machines. We are so entrenched, so allied, and so utterly captured by technology that we become blind to it. With one hand, I swear allegiance to the unknowable, mysterious omnipotence of the floating gods. With the other, we crank them across the sky. <laughs> so, with that dramatic, apocryphal intro, today let's talk a little bit about the ultimate contradiction. Building machines to save humans, which end up enslaving humans. And we speed towards our own destruction, relying more and more on the machines to save us that enslave us. We should consider embracing our impending non-human future. Part 1. Some Context Mm, not to stall us out too much, and long-time listeners, just jump five or so minutes ahead to part two, but we can recap real quick here what's in store by mapping out what came before. Now, in the last podcast, we covered some cybernetic systems theory. These are self-regulating systems such as a thermostat in your house. We mentioned some Deleuze and Watati, and Mark Fisher, but also Baudrillard and Bataille. They were all active in this period. Now, Baudrillard, who we covered in Step 38, was much more interested in simulations than economies of desire, saying that we have been liberated now only to enact meaningless scripted performances of revolution or victory. Because honestly, we just don't know what else to do, but we need to be rebelling. Now, this sounds familiar to Paul Picone and his artificial negativity that was in Step 64. 
which took Herbert Marcuse's theory of the one-dimensional man, step 63, and said, It's all too late. We have been captured by capitalism, swallowed by the totalizing slime of consumerism and the management state. So, mm, while a Buddhist may be able to sit in the slime and recognize that it's all an illusion, most of us succumb. And this is because we're being slowly, painfully digested under the acidic pressure of double binds, double blackmails, and contradictions. This persistent pressure crushes creativity, sovereignty, and autonomy while poking, prodding, and manipulating us through the attention economy, which we covered previously. Now, anxiety and helplessness mount as we work bullshit jobs. I mean, these are jobs that are irrelevant, from which we can find no means of escape. While it's definitely not the salt mines for the white collar worker, it is a life of drudgery and TPS reports. It's petty mid-level management bureaucracy and a lot of hassle. It's office politics. And this is all sort of palatably oversweetened by the saccharine shallow comforts such as ergonomic keyboards and 15 minute group yoga and t-shirts, swag, office swag. <laughs> Now, the movie Office Space starts to ring too true. We all pray at some point to be hit by a truck just so we can collect the insurance and design our jump to conclusions, Matt. <laughs> just remember, if you hang out in there long enough, Peter, good things can happen in this world. I mean, look at me. <laughs> now, in Alice in Wonderland fashion, the response to not playing the game is for the Red Queen to yell, Off with your head! But of course, playing the game makes you schizophrenic as well. <laughs> yeah, and schizophrenic being a split set of selves brought about by capitalism, which we call schizocapitalism. Now, what happens is one part of you behaves, it normalizes, maybe in the office environment, while the other half, the other self, frantically scrambles to follow the lines of flight towards escape. In other words, you're simultaneously colonized as you deterritorialize and fragment yourself. And of course, very smart people are saying we can't deterritorialize without it being re-territorialized again. And that is the maddening loop. So your efforts to do so, your, your rebellions, these just feed the machine and perfect the cybernetic system's negative feedback loops. Okay, so this is insidious because our anxiety actually feeds capitalism, which of course produces our anxiety. And after all, it is just energy at the end of the day. So what happens is we either normalize to the sociopathy required in the office place, right? And we kind of serve without a morality, a sans morals as sort of mercenary automatons. Or we rebel and our negative energies empower and program the system with alternate forms of capture, adjustment, and colonization. Hmm. Are we trapped? Well, as Margaret Thatcher said about neoliberal capitalism, there is no alternative. And Mark Fisher, he used Frederick Jameson's line, it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. So yeah, that's right. I've actually driven the podcast into a frightful trap. It's a dead end. The road has run out and the apocalypse is our escape. That's right, boys and girls. The only way out is to rely on your Uncle Mad Max. Yeah, get out your sunscreen, kiddos, because it's going to get hot and sandy and culty and petroly. Woo! Oh, yeah, bad haircuts and chainsaws for everyone. Mm. But what if there was a way out? A way to avoid the totally free market libertarian dream. <laughs> that is the might is right hellscape of Mad Max land. What if we can somehow leap over the barren apocalypse into the future? What if we can skip over Betty and Barney Rubble and become the Jetsons? Hmm. But of course, without all those family values and with only the darkest humor, right? Ah, we might end up in the realm of cyberpunk. Not only the historical sort of sci-fi genre, but even the new animated series on Netflix. Check that out if you get a chance. This new cybernetic reality won't pretend to be the attenuated democratic socialism we currently have. And utopic communism? Yeah, that's just gonna be a joke, right? It will be a new path, unfettered, unlimited by all these nation state restrictions. It will be cut free from the antiquated sympathy for the soul. Roads, where we're going, we don't need roads. 
Yeah, that's right. We're all entering cyberspace. Or the Matrix. Or Oasis. Or Metaverse. Or whatever. Any of them. All of them. Throw some Eon Flux in there too, and maybe some Snow Crash, because they're cool. Today we're going to be talking about the Futurists, then the Accelerationists. And this is kind of what happens when you can't put the genie back in the bottle, or undo the reliance on technology. The human becomes the bottleneck in progress. Our slow flesh and cumbersome morality are the very things preventing capitalism from collapsing on itself. So we just need to get rid of them, right? That way we can crash the system. When there is no alternative, the only way out is through. That's right. I mean, who knew that our problem here this whole time has been our restraint? <laughs> We're just known for that. I mean, really, we must speed up and accelerate this cybernetic capitalist machine until the pressure builds and we can invoke a rupture. Let's go so fast that we break the wheels off the machine. All it requires is to strip away our flimsy humanity and evolve into the hard metallic phallus. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Jeff Bezos. You got it right. Dicks in outer space. That's the way to go. Hard bodies and wired minds. Yeah. Let's go altered carbon, digitized consciousness, wetware, and mutable identities. This is the desert of the real. And you must lose yourself to free yourself. Part 2. Some history. Let's start out considering how we got here. In a super condensed fashion, of course, because it's got to be fast. Increasing industrialization back in the day, plus the capital to grow it, altered the way that labor works, which ends up altering society. Now, Marx criticized the system and automation and the alienation of labor and the processes, which all leads to the alienation of man from himself and others, even from the product. Communism was supposed to be great, a community, really. But Russia's version of communism was really hard industrialism that sacrificed and chewed through the laborers to grow the state into a war machine. Yeah, that's rough. And around this period, we had Italian fascism rise up as well. This is like 1910s, right? And within those ranks were the Italian futurists, or dynamists. The movement was called futurism. So check these guys out when you get a chance, and try not to confuse them with modern-day futurists like Ray Kurzweil, who, of course, wants to put electrodes in their brains or butts and armpits, I don't know, whatever. But in the 1909 manifesto of futurism, because, of course, everyone needs a manifesto, though no one can be bothered to slow down and read them. Hmm. But anyway, the futurism manifesto praises speed and violence. Point four. We affirm that the world's magnificence has been enriched by a new beauty, the beauty of speed. A racing car whose hood is adorned with great pipes, like serpents of explosive breath. A roaring car that seems to ride on grape shot is more beautiful than the victory of Semethris. And of course we have this line, which is point nine. We will glorify war, the world's only hygiene. Militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of freedom bringers, beautiful ideas worth dying for and scorn for woman. <laughs> That's right. Destruction is good, women is bad. <laughs> uh, sorry, mm, serious. Point 10. We will destroy the museums, libraries, academies of every kind. We will fight moralism, feminism, every opportunistic or utilitarian cowardice. <sighs> so obviously the Italian futurists were a bunch of misogynist tech fetishists who glorified the war machine. They really glorified speed and newness, and this seemed to be one of the first groups that really advocated for integrating man with machine as much as possible, because here we go, the, the machines were actually outstripping man, they were displacing him, and this new sort of god of gears and destruction, maybe it demands obeisance. So what happens is they see the future, and it's all chrome and metal, it's men and missiles extinguishing themselves for the sake of progress. Our soft, slow meat is weak. And for real progress, rapid progress, the human is disposable. A sacrifice to the admirable terror of speed and technology. Now, lest you think all this is too hypocritical, Filippo Tommaso Marinetti says, Others who are younger and stronger will throw us into the wastebasket like useless manuscripts. We want it to happen. Now this insanity, it seems about right for the times. This is kind of a toxic embrace of power and chest beating and a compulsion to play with all your new shiny toys. This is a real He-Man Woman Haters Club. 
this movement ended up sort of disappearing or getting crushed or maybe only rechanneled after the excessive destruction of World War I and on into World War II. Now, as history progresses, there is physical rebuilding from the wars and nation building. Now, of course, <laughs> this is getting into a history lesson, but stick with me because it's going somewhere. In America, we have an ab reaction, an immunological response, a rejection of the normalized power mongering that creates the waste of the Vietnam War. So the 60s and 70s war machine, this is a kind of disguised futurism chewing through men and machines under the thinnest of pretexts. And this is provoking the hippies to announce dropping out and free love. Now this influences the creators of the internet with utopian visions, by the way, all the people that created the internet were government and university employees. And what happens here is they dreamed of free access. And this was a beautiful dream from this time period, which of course today has been hijacked for a number of reasons that we can get into later. But anyway, this is how all of this stuff wraps up and relates together. Now, simultaneously in the 1970s, we started to see that corporations began to shed actual production. This is concrete reality, the real for a more deregulated abstract financialization. This is speculative trading. Reality was actually losing money, so we shifted from the real, this is lowercase r, to the real, uppercase r, which is the production of values, not things. So we went from reality to the production of values. And this is why Baudrillard talks about things like simulation and simulacra. Now, as reality merges with and leans on abstraction, we're also entering the age of digitization and computers. Mm, so you see how all this starts paralleling and lining up, where computers allow this abstraction to happen. These changes in the 70s and the introduction of internet access, coding, music, and deregulated markets all expanded wealth well into the 90s. Now, this is extended into very odd new lands by guys like Nick Land and the CCRU, which we need to do a whole podcast on later. But what's important to note is the spread of computers reignited the dangerously dormant pleasures of excessive speed. Yes, speed and cocaine were likely fueling this jittery momentum of the time, and they equally serve as a cautionary tell for these high finance rocket men burning out and crashing, much like the dot-com bubble. This is our society finding joyzance in futures. Part 3. Accelerationism In 2008, during the recession, we were watching an economic collapse and the attempted correction somehow leveraging our future with inflation. And what we saw was a bailing out of those who caused it while the masses, or proletariat, once again bore the brunt of the elite's idiocy. And of course, most of us realize this is all just going to keep happening. Nothing will change because nothing has changed. In cybernetic terms, you might want to consider this an, a possible failure of circular causality. That is, no one is taking in feedback and correcting anything. Literally, no one is steering the ship by looking for rocks and reacting to them. It seems more like at some point, Dad just handed the ship wheel to his worthless son wearing designer dock shoes, a guy who shared all the champagne with his fraternity brothers, and they wrecked the ship. So dad, being a nice, loving dad, just bought them another ship and gave them a nice pat on the rump and said, get back up on that horse, boy, or ship, or yacht, whatever. Now, what happens here is the rest of us, in our despair, we're looking for a solution so this won't continue happening. Now, the accelerationists are one of these groups. It's somewhat theoretically based, but what kind of happens here is their name comes from snagging Benjamin Noy's sort of more pejorative term, which is accelerationism, and they reappropriate it. And how did they do this? Well, naturally, through a manifesto. What they say is, the 2008 financial crisis reveals the risks of blindly accepting mathematical models on faith. Yet this is a problem of illegitimate authority, not of mathematics itself. Yeah. And reading on with it, I'm nodding my head most of the way. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, I agree, right on, yes. In part three, we get into this. Capitalism has begun to constrain the productive forces of technology, or at least direct them towards needlessly narrow ends. And rather than a world of space travel, future shock, and revolutionarily technological potential, we exist in a time where the only thing which develops 
is marginally better consumer gadgetry. Hmm. Essentially, capitalism and neoliberalism have repackaged conservative values and are slowing down technological progress, which, for the accelerationists, is synonymous with human acceleration. Tech progress and human acceleration seem to be the same thing, the movement into the future. But what we're arguing for is not techno-utopianism. Never believe that technology will be sufficient to save us. However, they do say it's bound up in social relations, and by tech progressing, it will overcome social conflict. That's a little tougher to swallow in a bigger leap. I mean, given how the internet has actually become divisive, I mean, there's still good things about it and all that, but whatever. Let's just keep reading. So then they bring up Cybersyn, which is a really cool project in Chile, which is a you know, social and economic model that seemed like it had a real chance to be an alternative system of governance and finance. That is, of course, until the U.S. snuck in and totally wrecked it. <laughs> but of course, we're going to end up having a whole podcast on that someday. So this manifesto says, The habitual tactics of marching, holding signs, and establishing temporary autonomous zones risks becoming comforting substitutes for effective success. At least we have done something, is the rallying cry of those who privilege self-esteem rather than effective action. Whoa, ouch, right? Because, yeah, these old classical forms of refusal, yeah, they may sort of be historic, but they still work to reshape the system. So cynically, we might kind of take the Pacon path at like artificial negativity and say that they really only allow the cybernetic system to adapt and better control us. But of course, we also need to kind of keep that in check and say, if the world can be shaped for the better by something like a peaceful march or a rally, well, then it's not simply privileging self-esteem. Point 13. The overwhelming privileging of democracy as process needs to be left behind. The fetishization of horizontality and inclusion of much of today's radical left sets a stage for ineffectiveness. Secrecy, verticality, and exclusion all have their place as well in effective political action, though not, of course, an exclusive one. Hmm. Point 21. We declare that only a Promethean politics of maximal mastery over society and its environment is capable of either dealing with global problems or achieving victory over capital. Now this is kind of either awesome or scary. The accelerationists go on to speak of surpassing your constraints, recovering our dreams, moving beyond the bodily form. Hmm, and you might consider these, quote, relics of a more innocent moment, but that simply points out the, quote, staggering lack of imagination in our own time. And the wrap-up is, the choice facing us is severe. Either a globalized post-capitalism or a slow fragmentation towards primitivism, perpetual crisis, and planetary ecological collapse. What accelerationism pushes towards is a future that is more modern, an alternative modernity that neoliberalism is inherently unable to generate. The future must be cracked open once again, unfastening our horizons towards the universal possibilities of the outside. Part 4 Okay, I'll be frank and blunt about this. I find accelerationism alluring. <laughs> yeah, so part of me, of course, gets nervous and scared, and another part of me thinks, well, hell yeah, let's do something. And that action-oriented part is kind of the giddy young boy. It's like the Calvin and Hobbes version of me that just wants to go adventuring and launching my radio flyer wagon over the gulch just to see if I can break the sound barrier. <laughs> nope. Crash. <laughs> Next time, maybe I can tape some wings to the cart. <laughs> so this is an impulse rooted in humanity, which has, you know, in part driven us this far. It is really compelling to take action and be a bizarre type of hero taking the first steps into new territory, even if that's cyber territory or landing on Mars. This seems to be stereotyped as a masculine trait, but I think that there's a profound romance in risk and violence, as William James says, and that can be, and often is, upheld by an entire society. So what we're really dealing with here is people under pressure, perhaps lacking purpose and meaning and fixating or fetishizing a way out, a way through the anxiety and contradictions by finding and manifesting purpose. 
the accelerationists, much like the futurists, are not adverse to pain. Because this type of sacrifice, this sparks the death drive. The compulsion to go so fast, push so hard, that your death, or merging with the machine, becomes a glorious escape. Perhaps even a newfound state of peace. Perhaps you will cease to be. At least at the end of the revolution, all this nervous energy that you have, this twitchy feeling of wasting your life, can be channeled into something, a movement, some velocity, maybe enough to launch you into orbit. And there are several critiques of accelerationism, of course, because why not, right? But while it makes good points, it kind of literally calls out for a less rational world while still claiming math is to be relied on. Now, this is kind of confusing and also compelling because of its contradictions. Humans are contradictory creatures, and it gives you both. It harkens back to the 1970s. We'll say yes to math and science, but also open your mind, deconstruct your conservative values and institutions, denigrate the gatekeepers of education and culture, but enjoy the cosmos, satellites, and LSD that science discovered. So this is kind of what Benjamin Noyes and others like Alan Badu have called the tendency. This tendency, this is to look at the trajectory of reality and to consider the concrete facts. The empiricist actually ends up becoming fixated, unable to see a way past what seems imminent and inevitable. This tedium of fixing things into place or reifying things creates stagnation. So the tendency is to abstract it, to shift it into fluxes and flows. Now, Badu critiques Deleuze and Watari for going too far in the opposite direction, for becoming too optimistic. In their attempting to escape the logical rationality, the realities of capital, they abstract fixed reality into these processes, into flows and fluxes, dismantling reality so they might take flight from it. The problem is, as we discuss in our history section, capital already abstracted itself and took flight into speculative finance in the 70s. It became a transorbital dispersing fractal idea, truly a process untethered from reality. And the DNG sort of disposition, it implies we too should take flight from our static, singular, individual self. We should deterritorialize ourselves and the repressive structures around us in order to escape or smash the machine. But if we untether ourselves as well, are we not aligning ourselves with the path and tactics of capital? Are we not just following in its wake? Are we mimicking freedom while using capitalist tools and thus actually kind of staying within its realm of influence? I don't know. I haven't read enough, but it's interesting to think about. And this would be the question to put forward to accelerationism. Will unfettering, deregulating technology and dismantling the social and capitalist limitations that are put upon it, will this provide us with a better future? Or similar to the deregulation of markets and capital, Will stripping the limits away from technology allow a kind of merging, a man-machine integration that will provide, yes, a more exciting future, but also more confused, bleaker, maybe even twisted? Will we move into Blade Runner, where there are actually cyborgs who are more human than human? Have we romanticized the machine, seeing in it our own loss of humanity, while we are, you know, confoundingly surrounded by humanity, is finding and bonding with the machine just easier, more frictionless than falling in love with each other? What happens with love, desire, and devotion whenever tech sort of paves the way to this machinic future? Now, this might seem a bit off topic, but I think it's worth considering how we have been culturally shaped to accept the imminent, inevitable future of tech. Some easy examples are things like the Terminator, where, right, this is crazy, because we turn the killer into the loyal protector. The machine future that scares us so much is also the future that provides a machine that protects us. <laughs> or alienated humans find a compatible life mate in movies like Her, which is flipped into a tragedy in such movies as Ex Machina, which brings us all the way back to the beginning. Du Ex Machina. Accelerationism is refocusing us on the mechanics the real. We are worshipping the cranes and trap doors now that hoist our gods into place. The accelerationists are pulling back the curtain and shifting the worship to a power that has the potential to save us from ourselves. But it's still not obvious that these gritty mechanics will be any better than a belief in the divine.
Thank you so much for your time. We have definitely not exhausted all of the fascinating complications, both theoretical, psychological, and practically, that accelerationism sort of revels in. It tends to expose kind of the best and the worst of a couple different ideas into a terrific mess. I really like it. <laughs> but I have been reading Benjamin Noy's Malign Velocities, which I highly recommend. It's right up there with Mark Fisher's Capitalist Realism for me. And it also happens to be another Zero Books publication. So check them out if you have a chance. More importantly, what will we be covering next week? Well, <laughs> obviously Benjamin Noy's Malign Velocities, where I really got most of this episode from and where he unpacks and pretty thoroughly dismantles the motivations behind accelerationism. Because at the end of the day, exciting can very easily become dangerous. Okay, okay. So if you enjoyed this episode, please rate the podcast. And if you really, really liked it, please give us a review that says, oh my God, this is the best. Squee! And the only way this show is ever going to grow and let me put out more content is if more people share it with their friends. And then everyone goes to lettusthinkaboutit.com and supports us with a one-time contribution or a monthly subscription. And then I actually get more time to read and write and more weird stuff will come out. All right, hooray. <laughs> this is Writer Richards once again. Thank you for listening and stay safe.